Hallelujah. What a song, huh? God of Israel. Wow. Wow. I want to welcome those that are joining us on our live streaming. And uh, we just came through a really powerful song by Maverick City called God of Israel. Uh, there's a lot of gods today. You talk to people, everyone believes in God. Ask them, what God do you believe in? You'd be surprised to find out how many pe people believe in, in different gods. You know, when people ask me, what God do you believe in? I tell them I believe in the God of Israel. That's a page turner, right? That's a game changer. I believe in the God of Israel. Let me share a story with you. When I was in high school, uh, there were some really rough guys, and uh, they, they hung around in a threesome, and they would go to parties, and eventually throughout the party, at some point in the night, they would have someone, and they would just be, you know, beating, beating them silly. You know, I mean, they, they hurt some people. They hurt some people bad. And um, I was at a party, and I'm standing out there, and next thing I know, the three guys are there. And they're standing around me, and I'm thinking, oh, no. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in trouble. I, I was scared, you know, and they were just kind of looking at me, and no one was saying anything. And my brother showed up, walked out of the party. I didn't even know who was there. He's a couple, about four years older than me, and he has his entourage of guys, and they're all the bigger bullies. They're, they're like the bullies that graduated, you know, the college boys came home for a visit, and and they, they were just rougher and more experienced than this, this trio. And my brother walked up and stood in front of me and the guy that was a ringleader and uh, said, I don't like you. And the guy says, well, why don't you like me? He knew him. He said, why don't you like me, Mickey? He said, I've never done anything to you. Never. I haven't done anything to you. Why don't you like me? He says, I don't like you because you don't like my brother. So leave him alone. And then he walked off. And I continued to shake in my boots. And they kind of stared at me for a while, and then they walked off too. He's the God of Israel. Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He said he came to save the lost house of Israel. He even told them, don't go to the Gentiles. I've come to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, later, he opened that up to the Gentiles. But he was all about Israel, and he's still about Israel. He's a Jew, and he said salvation is of the Jews. Why do I say that? Because I believe God's saying, hey, I'm the God of Israel. And I don't like you. Because you don't like the Jews. You don't like my people. My son's a Jew. So get it right. And I really believe that we're living in a time and an age where we need to rise up and stand with the people of Israel because we believe in the God of Israel and they are his people and we're grafted in. And Jesus is coming back as the line of the tribe of Judah. All the gates in the heavenly Jerusalem are named after Jewish people. It's time to connect and rise up and find our group identity in Israel, for it's their God that we believe in and their Messiah that we've embraced. God of Israel, he's a cloud rider. He's a cloud rider. He comes riding on the clouds to meet our needs, to deliver us, to provide for us. He's an amazing God. He's the most high God. Hallelujah. All right, well, this time we're going to go ahead and uh, go into our liturgy, so... Elder Gary and Cindy, if you'll come up and lead us in the liturgy. Thank you. Please rise for the blessing over the menorah. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, ruler of the universe, who sanctified by us your, by your commandments and justified us through the blood atonement of Yeshua HaMashiach and gave us Yeshua our Messiah, the light of the world. 
Father, in commemoration of creation and recreation through Yeshua, the light of the world, we bless the menorah, the ancient symbol of your presence among us. Bless, blessed are you, Yahweh, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments and justified us through the blood atonement of Yeshua HaMashiach and commanded us to be a light for the nations. And it was evening, and it was morning the sixth day. The heavens and the earth, and all that they contained, were completed. By the seventh day, God had finished his work, which he had been doing, and so God ceased from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because on it he ceased from all the work of his creation. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, ruler of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments, and has taken pleasure in us and love and favor, you have caused us to inherit the holy Shabbat in remembrance of the creation, a day from which the beginning of our holy gatherings is a memorial to the departure of Egypt, even our Egypt from sin and shame. For you have chosen us and forgiven us our sins through the blood atonement of Yeshua HaMashiach, and in love and favor have caused us to inherit the Shabbat for rest and refreshing. Shema, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them as you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they will be frontals on your forehead. And, when you <clears throat> and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. And when you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is a light. And reproof for discipline is the way of life. All right, and at this time, we'd like to invite our families up so that we can impart a parental blessing on our children. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. All right, we're going to start with our daughters first. So if you will repeat after me. May Yahweh bless you. May Yahweh bless you. Like Sarah and Rebecca. Like Sarah and Rebecca. Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah. And Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. And Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. And may you find favor. May you find favor. In the eyes of Yahweh. In the eyes of Yahweh. All the days of your life. All the days of your life. And for our sons. May Yahweh bless you. May Yahweh bless you. Like Ephraim and Manasseh. Like Ephraim and Manasseh. And may you find favor. May you find favor. In the eyes of Yahweh. In the eyes of Yahweh. All the days of your life. All the days of your life. And now for one another in the entire congregation. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious to you. Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, our Messiah. Please just take a moment and pray with your families.
You may be seated at this time. We have a few announcements before we move on with the rest of our service. The first of which is that children will not be dismissed until offertory time, and we'll let you know when kids will be dismissed. Uh, my next announcement is, if you weren't here last week, Torah Midrash class is back. You can join us every Saturday starting January 1st from 11.45 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. in room one as we study and discuss each week's Torah portion. And you might be like, what's a Torah portion? We just break down, we don't personally, but there's a breakdown of the Torah that you read throughout the year. That's the first five books of the Bible. Um, and we read a portion each week. So you can join us if you read it at home, come to our Midrash, and then we can all discuss it and have a good time getting into the details. Um, child care will not be provided, but parents are welcome to bring their kids to class. We have a few membership-related changes coming 2022. There will be a new password to the membership directory on our website starting January 1st, and the password will be disseminated to members prior to this change. In addition, there will no longer be membership boxes in the foyer starting January 1st, so please make sure to collect all your personal items from your box prior to January 1st. At this time, please stand and greet one another.
Thank you, Chris. Um, well, it's the time in the service again for us to collect our tithes and offerings, and so the uh, ushers will uh, give you an uh, envelope if you need it, if you're giving cash. Uh, those that are live streaming, if you want to give, you can give through PayPal. I think the, it'll, the instructions will be v obvious to you. Uh, and, um, and then we're going to continue with the service. I think I'm going to try today. Uh, we're, we're our, one of our goals is kind of to keep the theme of Hanukkah. And I know we're outside technically, but the season of Hanukkah is still on us uh, in a sense of the joy and celebrative kind of approach. So I'm just going to share a brief offertory. I think I'm going to come in the back door in a way um, to come back to some key points of Hanukkah. Uh, and uh, to start with, let me just ask you to ask yourself, what were you doing this time last year? Were you, what was your perspective on the seasons? Um, what about two years before that and maybe three or four? It's, if I go further and further and further back, all of us would probably remember a time where our focus this time of year was on something other than Hanukkah uh, and the, uh, the Torah of Yahweh. And the reason we are where we are is because somebody took the time to... Um, share with us, to, to bring us to an understanding, plant seeds in regard to God's ways. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians um, 5, there's a verse that um, says that all is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So somebody took some time to, uh, to engage in the ministry of reconciliation in regard to us. And so one, uh, one of the things I wanted to cover today was just uh, what it takes for us to do likewise. Uh, if you look at the narrative in our Torah portion, it, some people consider it kind of the crown jewel of the narrative in Genesis. It's about Joseph and his brothers. And you remember the brothers sold him into slavery, and, and then Joseph... Um, uh, eventually rose to uh, the position of viceroy of Egypt. And, um, but it involved reconciliation, uh, the, the Torah portion, and forgiveness. And Joseph's um, capacity to forgive uh, arose or grew out of his high view of the sovereignty of God. If you look in Genesis 50, where he said, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Because Joseph was confident in the ultimate purposes of God, he felt no need to pay his brothers back, to exact any retribution. He could leave matters in God's hands. Now, we don't know at what part. This, is, this was a 22-year process from the time he was slow, uh, sold into slavery until he, um, uh, we find the narrative of the Torah where he's engaging his brothers. And so... Again, we don't know exactly when he came to this understanding. It might have been a gradual process. It might have been a revelation at one night. Uh, but he got there. And um, Chuck Colson, in a book uh, that he wrote uh, in the 1990s, quoted an 18th century theologian and said this, because this is tied into uh, Joseph's view of the sovereignty of God. The dominant principle of Christian truth is not justification by faith but the sovereignty of the triune God over all of the cosmos and all the spheres and kingdoms, visible and invisible. Now, he wasn't challenging salvation by faith. He was putting out there that the dominant theme is a, a knowledge of the sovereignty of God. In other words, if I'm saved by faith, which I am, that, but I have a low view of the sovereignty of God, then I'm going to struggle uh, in my attempt to forgive other people. If I have a low view of the sovereignty of God, then I'm going to struggle in my attempts to be a messenger of reconciliation with others. All of us come from a certain amount of brokenness and dysfunction, popular word today, in our families and background. But if I am saved by faith and I have a high view of the sovereignty of God, I'm going to be much more likely to be available um, to extend forgiveness to those who have betrayed or hurt me. Ironically, it's usually those who are closest to us who should have nourished and, and, and nourished us, uh, but instead in some ways maybe even betrayed us. Well, if we have a high view of his sovereignty, then we'll be able to be an agent of forgiveness and an agent of reconciliation. Um, uh, and you see this with Joseph again. He said, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh 
and Lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So in the betrayal, in the rejection, in the alienation, uh, looking back, Joseph saw the hand of God to, to bring about life. Uh, if we look back on our journeys, where we are today, some of the, the dark times uh, were ultimately meant where God is big enough and sovereign enough to bring life for what the enemy meant was for death uh, and uh, limitation. Now, there, we can, from the, the narrative uh, in, in the Torah, we can look at several steps of uh, reconciliation. One is just the honesty. When, when uh, um, Joseph addressed them, he said, he did admit, you sold, you sold me into slavery. He didn't deny what happened. He was honest about it, but he didn't lean on that. He leaned on the sovereignty of God and the purposes of God. First step is honesty. The second was encouragement. He was able to encourage his brothers. He knew them well enough to know they needed it. Third was focusing on God's purposes. Again, he said this to his brothers. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. Um, there were two parts to this. One, Joseph recognized the hand of God in his circumstances. Think back to some of the dark days you were in and just see if you see the hand of God as Joseph did to bring about life and not death. And the second part was his awareness of what God was doing. Again, it was tied in to life. And lastly, the, the, the steps of reconciliation is have to do with preserving the remnant. When you were in those dark moments and then God reconciled you uh, and reached out to you, it was for the purpose of preserving life. So understanding God's purposes in life is bigger. When we understand God's purpose in life, we come to an understanding that there's a bigger picture here, and it has to do with preserving life, uh, and we get to be a part of that. Um, but it rests in the sovereignty of God. Now, this actually does tie into um, our celebration with Hanukkah because in the sovereignty of God, the Greek Syrian army was defeated when they should have won. And then after that came the temple dedication. After that came the Feast of Light, the themes changing. And so a lot of what we're doing uh, is rest on that theme. Now, the, so as we celebrate, and we're not through celebrating, but as we celebrate, we can kind of look back and see what God did in those days as we move forward so that we can be available in our own unique spheres of influence to be ministers of reconciliation. So let's pray just, just briefly, and Father, we, uh, we thank you for your sovereignty. We confess that you are Lord of lords and King of kings, um, and that uh, you're uh, sovereign over every area of our life and experience. Um, we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring this to a deeper understanding in all of us uh, so that we can uh, share your joy um, as we celebrate your seasons and your, ho your holy days. In Yeshua's name, amen. Ushers, you may serve the people. Uh, I'm gonna need. There you go. Thank, I'm gonna need the mic just for a couple more minutes as they're serving, uh, and you guys can go ahead. Just just do what you need to do. I'm gonna talk while you're uh, while you're doing it. Um, do I need to move this? There we go. Um, part of the theme of Hanukkah is that as you grow in your relationship with Yeshua. And in his fullness, your joy grows, too. The more uh, that you uh, draw near to him and the more you reflect him, the more joy that you encounter. And it allows us to really celebrate and party, uh, if you will, uh, with joy. Um, G Yeshua said that um, my joy I give to you. And he said, I speak these things to you that my joy may be uh, fulfilled in you. And I think it's the desire of the, the, prayer, the worship team. They're going to be coming on stage here momentarily. Um, they're expressing joy. The joy that's on the other side, so to speak, of coming to an understanding of the sovereignty of God, the victory of God, and the, our redemption from darkness uh, out of what should have been certain defeat to victory. And um, it's their desire as they, uh, as they come on stage for us to share that joy with them as we continue on in the Hanukkah season. So with that, uh, dance team, you're uh, clear to come on the stage.
Cause I I'm waiting for the stars tonight So I just light the fire, set the night alight Night one, stay up for the fun, chop the count, let the dreidels roll Night two, get up and move, dance party in the living room Singing songs for the Maccabee from dawn until night three Night four, say my sewer, getting showered in gifts galore Well, that was great. I hope you guys are having and have had a great Hanukkah season. We're going to move into the reading of the Torah portion, but before I do that, I want to dismiss all the kids and teachers that haven't left yet for Torah time. So you guys can make your way back to your classes and have a great time back there. The parashah for this week is Vayagash, 
translated, and came near, and is found in Genesis chapter 44, verse 18, and runs through chapter 47, verse 27. We're going to read a portion of the portion. I'd like to invite Alexia Formby to come forward for the blessing over the Torah. And our reader today will be Wendy McGaffey. Please stand. Let's begin with the opening blessing for the Torah. Baruchu et Yahweh hamevorach, Baruch Yahweh hamevorach leolam vaed, Baruch ata Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher bachar banu mikor haamim, Vanatan lanu et Torato. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all peoples and gave us your Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. Please extend your right hand of blessing to the one who has come up to honor Yahweh, he who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Wendy McGaffey, who has come up to honor Yahweh and the Torah of Moses. May the Holy One bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of her hands. Genesis 45, 1 through 12. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent before me you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Let's end with the closing blessing for the Torah. Baruch ata Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah temet, vechaye olam nata betocheinu. Baruch ata Yahweh, notin ha-Torah, amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Wow. Who was that dreidel guy, right? 
I mean, it was ridiculous. I told them, I'm, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. So I'm glad they found someone. Okay. All right, we're in our season of Hanukkah. And so uh, I want to just jump in and address some of the issues that we struggle with around the year. You know, we go around this liturgical calendar that our Father in Heaven has given to us. And the pagans have a calendar too. And they have eight festivals too. They're the counterfeits. But they predate ours. They go way, way back. So today I want to talk about Christmas. I want to talk about the idea of whether Christmas is a syncretism or not. Is Christmas a syncretism? The big question is, are we all free to worship God any way we want, with any traditions we want? Can we choose our own worship days? Does God even care as long as our hearts are right towards Him? During this season of Hanukkah, in which we rededicate to God our lives, where we commit to Him and His ways, it's in this season that we seek His face. The question is, is what does He say about worship forms and worship days? If we are rededicating our lives to his word and his ways, then this issue of worship is truly important. Here's a few other questions that we need to ask. Keep in mind, God has called us to be holy, to be separate, to be different, to be distinct. And believe me, when we keep his ways, we are distinct. We become counterculture. We even become counter to the church's culture. Because as Dr. Francis Schaefer, the late Dr. Schaefer said, the church runs about five to seven years behind society in terms of the culture and its values. So embracing God's ancient paths, we become counter culture even in the church. Here's some questions. Why do we forever do what God has never commanded and at the same time forever neglect what he has clearly commanded? Think of worship days. Think of the calendar, right? If Messiah never believed or practiced what we do, then why do we? And if we believe and practice what he wouldn't, we need to ask ourselves, Why? Why would we do what he would not and did not do? Now, these are sensitive issues, and people get pretty worked up over these issues. And so I want to say from the outset, we're saved by grace through faith in the Messiah. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. What I'm talking about is not a salvation issue. It's a discipleship issue. It's about following Jesus is what it's about, but it's not salvific. We're saved by grace through faith in the Messiah. This now becomes an issue of how shall the saved live their lives? Think of worship. In the Word of God, we encounter this idea of true worship, which implies there are false worship systems. True worship. Is there such a thing? And if so, then certainly there are false worship forms. Let's jump into John chapter 4 verses 20 through 26. Jesus is with the woman at the well. She's a Samaritan. The Samaritans are the ones that uh, stopped along their way into the promised land at, uh, I think it was, um, Mount Ebal, where the blessings and curses were pronounced, and they built a shrine, a a temple there. They stayed there. And the rest of the Jews continued to move all the way up into Jerusalem. And then the Samaritans intermarried with the Gentiles up in the northern part of Israel. So these are the Samaritans of Jesus' day. And so he's encountered this Samaritan woman at the well. It's just him and just her. 
and he is revealing himself to her, and he's prophesying to her. He's reading her mail, and she's quite astonished with him. And she even says, I believe you are a prophet. I perceive you're a prophet. And so she asks him the bigger question about worship. You know, where do we worship? The Jews say we worship in Jerusalem, but our people say it's over here where we're at. This, this is where Jesus, uh, this is where I pick up the story. Uh, verse 20, John chapter 4. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and yet you, Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one must worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Verse 22, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. Think about that for a moment. These are Samaritans. They're worshiping the same God that the Jews are worshiping. They had a difference as to where they would build that temp temple. But they love God. And they're trying to worship Him. Their heart is right. And isn't it enough if your heart is right? Isn't that enough? I mean, we hear that all the time. God doesn't really care as long as your heart is right. Jesus says, you don't know what you're worshiping. We worship what we do know. Because salvation is from the Jews. See, we're called to worship God with all of our hearts, but also within the truth of his guidelines that he's given to us concerning worship. Verse 23, Jesus goes on to say, A time is coming and even now has arrived when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Again, true worshipers versus what? False worshipers. This is what he's saying here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, that implies that there are false worshipers or those who worship God in false ways, ways that are unacceptable. He says the Father's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth with all of your heart to open up your heart and to be passionate about your love for him and then also also in accordance with the truth you can worship in accordance with the truth and your your heart not be in it god does not accept that and in the same way you can have a heart that's you know full of love for god but you're careless in terms of his guidelines about how you worship him. He won't accept that either. The Father's looking for those whose hearts are fully his and also will worship him according to his ways, on his terms. He is God, not we ourselves. This is what makes us true worshipers, when we worship from our hearts and in accordance with his ways. Verse 24, God is the Spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's an imperative. This is not a suggestion. Jesus is saying you must worship in spirit and in truth. Both. Not one or the other. Both. It's a requirement. This is whom the Father is looking for. This is Jesus' paradigm for worshiping the Father. This is why we do what we do this is why we embrace god's holy days because he says these are the worship days these are the appointed times they're fixed come meet with me these these are his parameters for worship they include worship days that's why we do what we do because we're not just passionate about the father we're passionate about his ways because he told us to be passionate about his ways this is why we do what we do we love and we follow Yeshua, who modeled that, by the way, for us. And this brings up the subject of idolatry, because false worship is really a matter of idolatry. And idolatry is, is really not understood very well today. We tend to think of idols. That's what we think of, right? You can't have a, a, an idol of a, of, a, of a false god and then bow down to it and worship it. 
But idolatry is much more than that. And there's some subtle aspects to idolatry that if we don't understand it, we could fall into that seduction of idolatry without realizing it. So let's look closer at idolatry. I'm going to pick up Deuteronomy chapter 5, and uh, this is 6 through 8. These are, these are the 10 words that God spoke to Israel when they became a nation before him. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods besides me. And, and what the Hebrew is conveying here is relationship. God's saying, you and I are in relationship. I don't want you to have relationship with other gods, though. Yeah, I want you to have a relationship with me and me alone. But you're forbidden to have, in addition to me, not in place of me. Now, I know you're smarter than that, is what he's saying, right? He's saying, no, in addition to me, you got to let go of these other gods. No longer can you relate to them. It's me and me alone. Then he goes on, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting the punishment of the fathers and the children, even on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Making an idol is just simply a manifestation of the fact that you already have a relationship with other gods. You know, you can have that without having the idol, by the way. God's saying, I don't want you flirting around with these other gods. And don't make idols to them. And then don't bow down to them in addition to that. I won't tolerate it. We're in a relationship. God describes that relationship with various metaphors. One is marriage. That's why, that's why when you flirt around with other gods, God calls it idol- or adultery. He shifts with the metaphor and says it's adultery when you do that. So that idolatry becomes a form of adultery where we violate our covenant, our marriage with God. He says, if you do this, I will punish you. I'll chastise you. Again, it's not a salvific matter. It's a matter of discipline. God wants us to give him our whole heart, undivided. And he says, if you'll do that, I will bless you. So, it goes on in verse 10. I'll show favor to thousands. It's actually to thousands generations. To those who love me and keep my commandments. And just a side note, if you compare those two verses of punishment and love, you'll see that love is far greater in its scope than what his chastisement is. Rewards and punishments. They incentivize good behavior. We may not want to admit that, but it's true. Rewards and punishment incentivizes good behavior. So let's worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's move on now to pagan forms of worship because pagan forms of worship also are included under the category of idolatry. And this is where most people just kind of jump off the ship. And they don't understand this. But God includes within the laws of idolatry, taking a pagan form of worship, repackaging that, assigning new meaning to it, and then offering it up to him. He says, that's idolatry. Don't do that. Let's look at the laws of idolatry. They're found in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 28 through 32. It says, be careful and listen to all these words which I'm commanding you, so that it may go well with you and your sons after you forever. For you will be doing what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. When the Lord your God cuts off from you the nations which you are going in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and live in their land. Verse 30, be careful that you are not ensnared, ensnared, Be careful. There's a trap laid for you. Any trappers here? You know how to trap animals? Yeah. You you take the trap and you bury it under some brush and you expose just the bait for the animal. The animal comes up, sees the bait, doesn't see the trap. 
And then what happens? Well, the animal's caught, and you know the rest of the story, right? Fur coat, leather boots, or whatever. God says, be careful that you are not ensnared to follow them. You know what that tells us? That their pagan worship forms are alluring. They're beautiful. They're powerful. They're spiritual. You know, for for those who who have been involved in paganism, you, you know that's true. Those that haven't wouldn't know that. But when you deal with paganism, there are spiritual aspects to that and, and gods, fallen gods, related to that because that's what you're going to worship. And that pull, that experience, that phenomenon is powerful, seductive. It'll capture you. God says, be careful that you're not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from your presence and that you do not inquire about their God, saying, hmm, how do these nations serve their gods that I also may do likewise? We need to learn to leave the mysterious, the beautiful, the seduction of paganism alone. Not looking into it, and especially not co-opting it. In fact, verse 31 deals with co-opting that. It says, you shall not behave this way toward the Lord your God. He says, don't go and get caught up in that. Because if you do, ultimately, you'll end up bowing to other gods. That's idolatry. And he says, and in fact, I don't even want you to take that junk and bring it back to my house, which is different. That's the person that says, well, I'm not going to bow to their gods. I'm just going to take some of their stuff that's beautiful and powerful, bring some of that ritual over here, repackage it, give some new meaning to it, and then offer it up to God. God says, no, don't do that either. That too is idolatry. Don't bring that stuff into my home. Don't offer that up to me. I've already given you prescriptions related to how I am to be worshipped. The majority opinion of Jewish scholarship is that this verse is referring to worshiping, uh, worshiping God the way the pagans worship their gods. That's a consensus, by the way, of Jewish scholarship. That's important for us to understand. God forbids it. It's called syncretism. We'll get down to that in a few moments. So, here's the big question. Is Christmas permeated with pagan traditions and pagan forms of worship? That's a question we need to wrestle with. This is the number one most popular celebration around the world. Numero uno, around the globe. This this impacts all of us. The pressures are all around us. And it's no big thing if all that matters is worshiping God in spirit. But when he said, I'm looking for those who will worship me in spirit and in truth, this becomes an issue because he's commanded us to worship him on his terms, in his ways, and he's forbidden us to repackage paganism and offer it up to him. So we have to ask the question, is Christmas permeated with pagan traditions and pagan forms of worship? You know the major major pagan religions today? They say yes. Yes. It is. Wick is one of the most, I think, um, well, the largest for sure in the United States. In fact, there's a concerted move among the pagan religions to take back Christmas. They're reclaiming it. You know, when you go to university, you, you, if you get into any world religion stuff, you, you, this, this is the big issue right now. These pagan professors, they're reclaiming, they're taking charge. History's on their side. The documents, the facts, the evidence on their side. Let me give you an example. This is from a book called Ancient Ways, Reclaiming Pagan Traditions. I want to read the conclusion. It's at the end of the book. 
they make their case throughout the book of the traditions that we call Christian predating Christianity by hundreds of years, even thousands of years. And then they make the, the push to say, they're ours, give them back. You have no business appropriating them. That's an offense. They're ours. So it goes, on, it goes to say, I'll just quote it. It is a fairly safe guess that most of us, they're talking to their pagan brothers and sisters, most of us were raised in a Judeo-Christian tradition and that the seasonal celebrations of our parents and grandparents were some of the most wonderful times of our childhood. As we grew up, we questioned the religious beliefs of our parents and eventually many of us found our way back to the old gods and the old religion. One of the most painful parts of this spiritual quest was having to give up those wonderful family traditions that gave us so much joy in our childhood. But it isn't so. Some of the most wonderful traditions practiced by our parents and grandparents are purely pagan in origin. So go ahead and celebrate the customs of your childhood. Send valentines. Dye Eostra's eggs. Bring a fir tree into your house and decorate it with ornaments that came down in the family and know in your pagan heart that what you do is a traditional way of honoring the old pagan gods. And when someone says to you, I thought you were a pagan. Why do you have a Christmas tree in your house? You can look them straight in the face and say, because it's a pagan tradition. Why do you? Now, the fight is on. Been on for a long, long time. And Christians fight back and say that Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Christ. So who is right? Is it the birth of Christ? Or is it a pagan tradition related to the, what we would call, false gods? They're both right. Both sides are right. Christmas is not purely pagan, and it certainly isn't purely biblical. It is what scholars and professors of religion call syncretism. So what is syncretism? Let me give you a working definition. Syncretism. The reconciliation or fusion of differing systems of belief as in philosophy or religion, especially when success is partial or the result is heterogeneous. So what that's saying is this. If we have a system that God has given to us for how we worship him and when we worship him, and then paganism has a system of when they worship their gods and how they worship their gods, if we take some of their stuff, and they're opposing gods. God and the false gods are not at peace. There's a war on, right? This is a coup d'etat, an attempted coup d'etat to overthrow God and his son and take over the rulership of his creation. God is going to judge these false gods. So these different religions, the true religion that worships the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to his scriptures, and the religion of the pagans, they're different systems different gods, different values, different beliefs. You take some of that and some of this and bring it together and merge it. That's called syncretism, where you have elements of both and they're embraced by all. Syncretism. It's forbidden. It's a form of idolatry. But let's take a closer look at Christmas and sort out the true from the false. Because I believe it's important to understand that the birth of Jesus is significant. It's one of the most significant events that could ever be celebrated. It's a big deal. In fact, all of his life events that are significant 
are important for us to celebrate. And all of those are reflected in the calendar. All of the holy days give occasions to celebrate different aspects of who Jesus is. Even his birth, which was probably late September in the fall, right? Coinciding with tabernacles, which is why John takes the imagery of tabernacles and connects it with his birth by saying that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Yeah, we have, we have all these occasions to celebrate all of these important events in a way that's holy and at the appointed times. So yes, the birth of Jesus actually happened. It's the incarnation when God became a man. It's significant in every way. It cannot be dismissed. That's the truth part of Christmas. That's the true part of Christmas. And to celebrate that is not only appropriate, it's something that should be strongly encouraged among believers. So let's look at Christmas and say, okay, the birth of Jesus is legit. We want to do that. But what are the pagan aspects of this day? I'm going to start with the tree. The tree. That's that's perhaps the biggest of the traditions. The tradition of employing trees in religious celebrations is an ancient pagan practice. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Even our forefathers, Abraham and Jacob, were influenced with this practice. You can go and read about their lives and about how they did things around certain trees and why that was important and so forth. That's part of their own pagan background. Abraham was a pagan from Ur, if you remember, right? Israel, before she existed as the people of God, her roots are in paganism too. The story of Abraham is a story of turning away from paganism and pagan gods and embracing by faith alone the true God and the true worship of him. However, the beauty and the seduction of paganism is very strong. It's deeply spiritual, it's powerful, and it's alluring. Believe me, we all know it. You drive by some mall where they got a huge honking Christmas tree out there and all the lights and stuff, and it's like, you know, who's not not going to look at that and, and be almost mesmerized? The kids love that stuff, right? Absolutely. It's an ancient, ancient form of paganism. Jeremiah 6, 6 through 9. Then the Lord said to me in the days of King Hosea, Hosea, or Josiah, have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every leafy tree, and she prostituted herself there. Yet I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all of her adulteries, notice the shift, what is he calling what Israel did? Adulteries, right? For all of her adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and prostituted herself also. And because of the thoughtlessness of her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. If you're a Baptist, I know that's a hard one because they take everything literal. But let me put your heart at ease. It's not literal. You cannot commit adultery literally with a stone or a tree Okay, let's just move on. That's very awkward. This is talking about pagan idolatry. And what it's referring to is practicing things among the pagans. God says it's adulterous. It's idolatrous. Don't do that. She committed adultery with stones and trees. Why? because she was employing trees and stones in her worship. This is called idolatry. This is a pagan form that's identified as adultery. Israel was immersed in pagan forms of worship, 
which employed trees, employed trees and stones. This was a return to what she and all of us are familiar with, our pagan roots, our pagan cultures. She was warned and rebuked for this, and God finally divorced himself from Israel. Every December, we have the big temptation, the big struggle, all the pressure from family and friends. What are we going to do, right? I'm so thankful for Hanukkah, a call to rededicate our lives to God in His ways. It's a bulwark against all the paganism all around us. Think about it, right? Every year, Vatican Square, the main flow of Christianity, what do they have in Vatican Square every year? the biggest, most glorified Christmas tree you can imagine right next to the obelisk in Vatican Square. You have a tree and a stone. A stone and a tree. Think of Jeremiah, right? A stone and a tree in the religious center of Christianity. If you go to Washington, D.C., the National Mall, right? What do you have? A huge Christmas tree that the president flips the, the lights on, right? And it's right outside, and you see pictures every year of the tree and the Washington Monument, again, an obelisk made out of stone. This is what paganism has always been involved in forever and ever. So in summary, employing trees in our religious celebrations are forbidden. It's a throwback to ancient pagan practices. The pagans are right, and history is on their side. The tree is their pagan idea and their practice. It belongs to them. It's not biblical. It is forbidden. It's not a Jewish idea. It's not a Christian idea. It's what we took and tried to reassign meaning to, to bring in and offer up in our religious celebration of the birth of Jesus. Now, that's just one. There's other aspects that are full of paganism as well, but that's all I had time for uh, today. And, uh, and it's hard. It's a hard message. I, I have people almost every year when I, I talk about this, I always have one or two people walk out. And it just breaks my heart because I'm thinking if you'll stay and listen long enough, you know, you're, you're going to discover something. And that is, is, to worship God at all these same, uh, or, or, or to take all these same events and place them in the calendar that God has given to us, you lose nothing. You gain everything. No one's saying you can't celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're saying celebrate it in a way that honors Him, not the false gods that obscure who He is. But it's something that we have to talk about because we're called to be holy. And I'll tell you what, I'll quit talking about it when everyone gives up the trees and the stones. I will. But as long as that's all around us, encroaching on us, I mean, look at us, this is who we are. We believe in Jesus and we keep the commandments of, of God. How many groups out there like us are there? People, there's not many. There's not many. What we're doing is significant. It's important to God. He smiles on this. We need to unite to, 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 to unite and build and invite people and grow this. This is the kingdom of God, His ways, His laws, the glory of His Son. It's worth fighting for. It's worth standing for. Again, Jesus says, if you want to worship the Father, well... You got to do that in spirit and in truth, according to his ways. That is true worship. Anything else is false, and he won't accept it. This is our Hanukkah season. Let's rededicate ourselves, our homes, our churches to God and his ways and his holy days. Just say no to the ravishingly seductive pagan Christmas tree. It's a syncretism. It is forbidden to the followers of Yeshua, the Messiah. Do not judge them. Don't go around and try to tell people that's idolatry. Leave people alone, right? 
You had one not too long ago. Don't you be hassling? You, they're on a journey. You're on a journey. Just focus on you, right? Say no to the syncretism. Don't bring it into your house. It's forbidden to the followers of Yeshua the Messiah. Don't judge them, but don't compromise in your own walk and in your own homes. I always schedule myself on December 24th and December 25th. Every year I schedule myself weeks, weeks out. I make sure I'm scheduled to do something with someone on the 24th and 25th so that when my family and friends call because they want me to come celebrate Christmas with them, even though they know I don't even celebrate Christmas, they, they're, they're going to make it a point that I'm part of that family gathering. So I schedule way in advance to be other places. So when they ask, hey, we're, we're having uh, Christmas over here on the 24th or the 25th, you know, do you want to come over? We're going to have a dinner, you know. We know you don't like some of it, but you know what? It's great to be around family and friends. I always say, oh, man, I am so sorry. I am already scheduled, you know, maybe next year. <laughs> but that's a convenient way to kind of stay out of that place in which, well, it's going to constitute idolatry. I don't judge them, but I don't participate. Let's embrace God's holy days and holy ways, and let's reject the pagan days and the pagan ways. We lose nothing. We gain everything. Every celebration that's done in Christianity, we also do. Let me back that up. The major celebrations in Christianity, centering around his birth, his passion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his coming again, we do those too. We do those too. Just at different times, in different ways. We do them in accordance with the timing of God's calendar, his appointed times, and his ways. So we lose nothing. And we gain everything. So I'm going to close early on purpose to answer some questions. Because I know we all have questions on this matter. So I want to open it up to you to uh, go to some questions. Minister Don, would you um, take this back? Got a question right back in the center. There are no wrong questions. There are no offensive questions. There are no questions that I don't want to hear. So please <laughs> feel free to um, ask your questions. So here's my question. This year, December 25th falls on Saturday. Praise God for that. Yeah. And I've been able to find the courage to invite my non-believing family to Shabbat. So, God willing, the four of them will be here. Uh, what are you planning on speaking of? <laughs> I, I really wish that you, what you, know, you just, just spoke just, of today new. was what tell, you were going to talk tell, about I can on tell the you're new, okay? I can tell you're new, so I'm going to give you some advice. Ask me way ahead of time what I'm going to speak on on a particular day before you invite anybody. <laughs> going to want to know that ahead of time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to focus on Christmas on Christmas. You know, I, I'm thinking of just doing this ahead of time. Um, but, you know, I'll do my best to offend them. <laughs> just joking. I'll do my best not to offend. I don't want to offend people. I have no heart to offend. I want to win people to um, God in his ways, you know, and, and we all want that. We all want that. So, um, so yeah, it's interesting that Shabbat falls on Christmas because that is, uh, that's always fun. <laughs> Not quite as fun as when Hanukkah falls on Christmas too. Woo! Wow. <laughs> the Hanukkah menorah Christmas tree wars, you know. <laughs> okay, so another question? Someone? And you can always ask a question that maybe your friend has. I have a friend that has a question. How many people, this is, this is the first time you've heard 
Um, the whole issue of Christmas being a syncretism, is that new to you? I think most people, okay. Yeah, these are, these are um, issues that we grow up with. You know, ritual is more important than beliefs, or I shouldn't say that. Ritual is more powerful than beliefs. Ritual is something that trans, uh, transitions into each generation, even though the belief may not trail. So that all of a sudden, you're doing things that you don't even know why you're doing them. And that's the power of tradition or ritual. And that's why we have to say, God, you know, we want your traditions, your ritual, your ways. Because if we embrace things that honor the old gods, the false gods, then that's, that's you know, really, that's a shame that we would be doing that, giving that to our kids. And all of a sudden, our kids for generations to come are doing things that are offending the Lord God. So this issue of truth is vital to all of us, especially when it relates to worship. Worship's a big thing for God. It's a big thing. We don't need to come up with our own holy days. We don't need to come up with our own holy celebrations. We already have them, and they're a blast. They're absolutely fun in every way, filled with joy, food, dancing, wine, you name it. Okay, good. Question? Right here. Is it green? Hello? Let's try it again. Okay. Um, so, so one thing that's interesting is what are your thoughts on the amount of ministry and spiritual outpouring that people experience in the church during this time when they do worship when they do worship over over Christmas when they come to church and. There's a lot of churches that have experienced a lot of um, a lot of spiritual blessing and people coming to faith through Christmas, which I'm playing devil's advocate no, here, great. obviously. Yeah. But yeah, what are what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a very legitimate question. But it kind of brings up the idea that the end justifies the means. So as long as people are getting saved, it's okay. And we've seen that in other forms of spiritual abuse. If you've uh, followed the, the popular podcast on Mars Hill you know, and how that, that mega church, you know, rose so fast and then also just blew away. Uh, basically, what they were saying is even though the pastor and some of the staff, and there's a lot of abuse going on, all this, all these bad things are happening. You know what the leadership was saying? They were saying, yeah, but look at everyone. Everyone's getting saved. Look at all the marriages that are being healed, lives that are being healed, you know, people coming to faith. And that's how they justified the abuse until it finally got so big, it just blew up. Yeah, so I hear what you're saying, but just because good things are happening doesn't mean it's appropriate or even allowed by God, right? The end doesn't justify the means. And yes, a lot of people come to faith uh, during Christmas. You know what else? It's the highest season for suicides as well. That's the other side of the coin. Yeah, because this whole issue of paganism has a dark side to it. And the whole goal of the enemy is to strip you and rob you of what God has for you and take you over the top. So yeah, it's a two-edged sword and two sides of that coin. But thank you. Great question. Anyone else? Back here. What about gift giving? Like if you aren't putting up a tree or doing the lights, singing the songs, having the Christmas dinner, but you're giving gifts. Yeah, so gift giving isn't, so you have a lot of things pagans do that are not forbidden for us to do. It's pagan forms of worship that you're forbidden to do, okay? So there's a lot of crossover in our culture when it comes to things that both groups do and, and God has no problem with. But when it's related to a pagan God and a pagan form of worship, that's not allowed. Gift giving is kind of like a neutral zone. And we give gifts for all kinds of occasions, weddings, birthdays, Christmas, we brought that into Christmas, Hanukkah, we brought that into Hanukkah. There was a time in which people didn't give gifts during Hanukkah. Hanukkah. That's kind of a, of, a, of a United States of America type tradition that we brought into Hanukkah, at least the Jewish community did. Um, so gift giving in and of itself, I don't think is a problem. Um, I think that's a neutral issue. Uh, but it is interesting that when you put when you put the gifts under the tree, right? 
What do you have to do to get the gift? <laughs> Sometimes you have to get on your knees because it's way under there, right? And it's like, it's like, I think the devil laughs and says, look at your son. Look at my tree and your son, Lord. Yeah, I think it makes a mockery out of us. Mockery out of us. So, so the gift giving in and of itself is not a problem. Okay, I think we're done. Oh, wh- one more. We'll go one more. Okay, so what about having a nativity? Because technically, that's not really Jesus himself. So is that borderline idolatry because it is an image of God? Great question, great question. So uh, the issue of the commandment not to make things in heaven above or uh, from the earth or, or below the earth, that is in the construct of worship. If it wasn't, we couldn't have any art. There'd be no sculptures, there'd be no paintings, you know. And, and the Jewish people really hit, hit, hit it right when they said, if you look at the commandment, the prohibition is about making things that you're going to then bow down to and worship. So, so the art, the sculpture, the statue, whatever it is, that's not a problem. Unless you're bowing down to worship that, that becomes an issue. And so a nativity scene is kind of like an, uh, 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 you know, a piece of art, a visual, to bring to memory the beauty of the incarnation of the Lord. That in and of itself is totally appropriate. Like so much of everything else we do, both in Judaism and in Christianity, that's not problematic. Now the season for that, again, is going to be tabernacles. Um, and that's where you're going to find all those elements. The shepherds, right? Uh, the, the babies in, in swaddling clothes. All, those are biblical um, depictions of what took place in that incarnation. Totally appropriate. You can't put Santa Claus in the nativity though, okay? <laughs> if the sheep have glowing noses, it's a no-go, okay? We're starting to cross over. So... But that, that's kind of the idea behind that. It is complicated, and it takes, you know, years and years and years to kind of grow into the ways of God. And so we're all on that journey. And some are farther out of paganism than others. But we're all on that journey. And everyone has things to, to kind of um, work on. And uh, regardless of who we are, we are saved by grace. We are not being condemned The Father isn't judging us. He's just calling us out to become closer and closer to who He is, what He believes, and what matters to Him. And that's the journey that we're all on. So, (laughs) relax. We're going to go through the next several weeks, and everything's going to be okay. So praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless you. You're amazing in every way. And we thank you that you've called us out of darkness and into the light. And that you've given to us truth, true ways to worship you. And we ask you to just lead us all out on our journey towards you. You're beautiful. You're wonderful in every way. Amen. Please stand for benediction. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And we add, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, the Prince of Peace, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Receive now the name of Yahweh. Yivarech Yahweh 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 
פניו עליך ויישם לך שלום. בשם ישוע המשיח, שר השלום, שבת שלום.